Okay, here we go. And a one, a two, a one, two. Dr. Thomas Manuel, welcome to the Beyond the Expected podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is a real honor. Um, let's begin with what I hope is a straightforward question. Who was the young Tom Manuel? Um, what would he say to Professor Thomas Manuel, president and founder of the Jazz Loft, uh, endowed jazz artist in residence at Stony Brook University and director of the Stony Brook University Young Artist Jazz Program today? That's a lot. Wow. <laughs> well, the young me, I, I still think I am young, <laughs> but uh, the younger me uh, was a very strange kid. I was, I was always hanging out with older people, um, much older people. In fact, you know, I was a teenager into my early 20s, hanging out with guys that were in their 80s, if not older. So I, I was always very much so drawn to hanging out with really great mentors, uh, especially musically and jazz. You know, I was lucky that um, these guys had been around in the 30s and 40s and were on the scene when jazz was all happening and this was all going on. Um, so to answer your question, what was the young Tom Manuel like? He was, he was a pretty strange kid, although I, I do consider myself young and I, I plan to hit 100. So um, Good for you. That's the plan. And, you know, I think that if they met... Um, I think the one thing, although I look back and would love to tell a younger self not to do a lot of different things and <laughs> to do a lot of things better, uh, I think the one theme that was constant and still continues today, I think that young Tom Manuel would want to hang out with this guy and ask him a lot of questions. A lot of questions. So, so when exactly, you know, thinking about that, that youthful Tom uh, hmm. who was hanging out with great mentors, it sounds like, so when did you know you wanted to be a musician, jazz musician, and... And how exactly did that interest evolve? You knew it all along, or it was a torturous route to get there? How did that happen? Mm. It was a little bit of both. I, I, I loved music from the first moment I got my hands on a cornet. My, my dad had played, um, not professionally, strictly amateur status. And my grandfather played, and my grandfather and I were, were very close. Uh, he just actually passed about a month or so ago, 99 and a half, and was strong up until the end. God bless him. Um, but he played, and um, what was actually kind of funny, as a kid growing up, he used to say that he played the hosophone. So he had a, a, an oil funnel with a piece of garden hose attached to it and the mouthpiece on the end. And he'd play that, you know, and he said, this was the hosophone, you know. So in fourth grade, it came time and the teacher demonstrated all the instruments and said, well, what do you want to play? And I said, well, I want to play the hosophone. <laughs> and he said, you mean the sousaphone? And I said, no, no the hosophone. I explained it to him and I thought, well, gee, I can't believe they hired this guy. He doesn't even know what a hosophone is. <laughs> but then we, we soon figured out the instrument was the cornet or you know, the trumpet. And... I always loved music, and then I heard jazz, and I was just, I was hooked. And, and when did that happen? Roughly how old were you? I was probably in, I was probably in middle school, uh -huh. Uh -huh. probably in like seventh grade, somewhere around there. And a I, friend, a friend turned you on to it. You were in a class, you went to a performance, you, you know, recall? I do. I don't remember the specific event, but I remember it was a family event, and I'm pretty sure it was an anniversary party. And they had a DJ in the backyard. And this music came on that I never heard before. And I immediately knew it was the coolest thing I heard. And I had to know what it was. And I went up and I asked the guy. And he said, oh, that was Glenn Miller. They played In the Mood. And I went to the library. And you could, at my library, you could take out records and cassettes. And I started listening to that. And that led to Harry James. And that led to Bobby Hackett. So we need to find out the name of this DJ. And we'll name the jazz loft after this There you guy, go. Because... <laughs> He's the origin it story. It might be a conflict of interest to celebrate a DJ at a live performance venue. but That's, uh, that's great. So, so really, I mean, you, you are saying, though, that uh, all seriousness, I mean, really from a very early age, music was a passion, curiosity and inquisitiveness about music genres and performance and so forth was always there for you. And it seems Big to time. be deeply embedded in the family. That's right. It's wonderful. Um, just touching on matters of performance, I'm, I'm always eager to ask performers this. So... Uh, you know, what's your best performance memory? And if you like, what's your worst? I mean, uh, <laughs> give us the highlights here. I mean, you've performed so extensively. Maybe that's a maybe that's an unfair question. But. You know, it kind of evolves. Um, there's certain highlights that 
fall in different categories. I remember um, my first college gig, I, I took my students on tour and we performed at the Montreux Jazz Festival. And I remember, uh, of course, we go all the way there and we're ready for our performance and we're at the festival and all the preparation up to that. And we were really excited to share this music. We were performing Duke Ellington's Far East Suite. And of course it rained. And I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. All this work, all this planning, we came all the way here and it rained and now we're gonna go out and the stage was covered, but the audience was out in the open. So I'm backstage and the, the rules of the festival was you had to perform regardless of the weather. And I'm thinking, well, this is just gonna be an utter letdown. There's gonna be nobody there. And we walk out to the stage and there's hundreds of people. And we played and they gave us an encore in the rain. And I just remember looking out and, you know, the excitement and the energy. Um, well, and also the the approval from the audience. I mean, in the midst of right? rough conditions, <laughs> exactly. right? That's like, great, they're finished. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Uh, that That's yeah. terrific. What a wonderful story. Um, well, let's let's talk about the Jazz Loft. You know, this is uh, one of your great passions and uh, you know, uh, obviously a, a, a now a signature institution in our community. So... You know, tell us a bit about how this idea evolved in your thinking, how it came together. This has to be a this has to be a performance dream come true, a musician's dream come true for you. It really is. I think to have a space where you could really put the art as a top priority and not have to make really major compromises or sacrifices, that's rare. Um, there's a few things that exist at the Jazz Loft that allow us to stay true to our mission and stay true to that high standard. Um, the first is just the way that it happened was borderline miraculous. Uh, I had this incredible collection from these older mentors that had become great friends of mine, instruments, music, memorabilia, photographs, and my house was basically a museum and jam packed with stuff. And it got to a point where I realized, you know, I need to find a place for this. It's really not properly available to people and really all the guys I played with uh, they would have liked musicians historians to have access to it and as fate would have it I, this was just in the back of my mind it wasn't even something that I had thought out really at all and Newsday was doing a story on these five musicians that were friends of mine and they had played together in a band for over 50 years and this reporter interviews them individually and you know, looking back on 50 years, there was things that all of them couldn't remember. And independently, each one of them said, you know, you should call this guy Tom Annual. He remembers all this stuff, and he has a picture of that, and he has this and that. So this reporter called, and she said, could I ask you some questions to help with the story? I said, sure. She called again. She called again. I'm scanning her photos and sending her things and filling in dates and places. And in the middle of answering some questions, she interrupted me, and she said, stop. I said, what? She said, this is amazing that you knew these people, that you befriended them, that you started your teaching career, you brought them in to work with your students, um, that you put together these performances and workshops and events. She goes, I want to do a story on you. And I said, what the heck would you want to do that for? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and in retrospect, she was an amazing reporter. She, she hounded me for it had to be three months to the point where she was driving me crazy, you know, all these details and, and um, I remember one time she called me, I was at a festival and I, I, I hung up the phone and I thought, I'm going to call her back and say, enough, this is, I, you know, I don't want to do the story. But I had invested so much time, I didn't want to give up on it, you know. And to her credit, this wonderful story came out in Newsday, the cover of the arts section. And I don't know how she pulled it off, but she got five pages after the cover. I remember I, I looked and I went, holy cow, I'm on the cover. And I opened up and I went, Wow two pages. That's unbelievable. And then I got to the end and I thought, well, that's an odd way to end a sentence. If I turn the page and all these photos and, and the title she gave to the article said, Tom Annual has the collection. Now all he needs is a museum. And the phone rang and it was Gloria Rocchio, who's the president of the Ward Melville Heritage Organization. She introduced herself and she said, you know, we have this old building that used to be a museum. Maybe you and I should get together and talk. So we got together and she said, um, you know, maybe you'd consider uh, some sort of a museum or a performance space. And, and you have to remember, I never thought about any of this. So I'm on gigs and guys are saying, hey, I read your article. Great job. Wow, that's amazing. And, and I'm on this one gig and one of my mentors, bass player, John DeWitt, 
He said, so what are you going to do? I said, John, I teach high school. I'm a jazz musician. I'm broke. <laughs> what do you, what do you right. mean, what am I going to do? And he, he, got, he left, and then he got kind of serious, and he said, you know, he said, you're probably never going to get a phone call like this again in your life. He said, maybe you should just give that some thought, pray about it, and maybe you want to give that lady a call back. So I thought, that seems like sound advice. You good know? mentorship. Yeah, again. good mentorship, right. you know. Right. So I, um, I met with Miss Rocchio, and she said, well, you'd have to give a presentation to our board. So the director of jazz studies, Ray Anderson, who's here at the university, he and I got together, and I said, you want to do a presentation with me? He said, for what? I said, um, for a jazz museum performance space. He goes, well, what would that be like? I said, well, that's where you come in. And we, we really just, you know, to get serious for a moment, we dreamed up what that place would look like, that in our travels throughout the world, we always wished existed but uh -huh. didn't. And we went in. and missing. Yeah. And we made this presentation to a board of a, a space that was a performance space with an education component that had a preservation effort. And we kind of wowed them. And then they asked those important questions like, well, do you have funding and right. back Practical and, questions, yeah. sure. And uh, I kind of saw where I was going. And so I, I politely interrupted and I said, look, with, with the greatest of respect, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, we, we do not have any funding. We don't have any backers. We're not an established not-for-profit. Sure. But we really did appreciate the offer to make the presentation. And um, if we did have the opportunity, then, you know, we'd have to undertake some serious fundraising and so on and so forth. So I thought, well, that was that. And a few days went by, and then the phone call came. And I thought, well, this is the, you know, the thanks but no thanks. Right, right. And she explained how our other organizations were established and they had funding and some of them had grants already lined up and, and I'm waiting for the thanks, but no thanks, you know, and she went on and on. And, and then she said, but we kept coming back to your proposal. And finally, one of our board members said, I'll address the elephant in the room. We all know we should turn him down, but we all want to say yes. So is there anything we could do to make it happen? She said, so here's my offer. We would like to offer you a 49-year lease for a dollar a year. And I was kind of speechless for the first time yeah. in my life because as a performer, you learn how to kind of go on the fly. And I kind of did like the, you know, what's his name from the Honeymooners, you know, and, up, 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 up. <laughs> and she laughed and she said, well, why don't you give it some thought and, and give me a call back and I had just dropped my kids off at school and I was home alone in the kitchen and I hung up the phone and I looked up to the ceiling and I said, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't pray about this, but I didn't think I'd get this far. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, the heritage organization, you know, saw a great idea, great ideas in one level from themselves. Uh, they gave you the, they gave you the launching pad, literally the launching pad right. to, to, to start this effort. Let me ask you two questions about, about that, I mean, the the you get started. The loft has been a tremendous success. Um, you know, obviously, there an enormous community response uh, and embrace of of your mission uh, and what what gets done there. So, I guess two questions. One is, you know, how do you, in your mind, measure the impact of this uh, of this experiment? You know, what what are the highlights for you? And, and maybe a little more subjective or more personal question related to that is, how does this make you feel? Have this kind of impact on your community, uh, such an important contribution to the community, to the university, to the wider, you know, to the wider communities within which, you know, Long Island and even the music community itself subsist. Um, so curious how you feel around that. Right. Well, I think one thing that's important to point out is when it comes to measuring, there's some ways that are obvious, but there's some that are hard. And one of the challenges we have is, you know, in the entire United States of America, including us, there are only four jazz museums that celebrate an American-born art form, which was really our gift to the world. So it's hard. We, we can't look at a hundred other or a thousand other business models and say, well, let's compare ourselves to them. They've been around. They're successful. How are they doing? We're, we're kind of pioneering this. And, you know, it's funny, you, you mentioned the young Tom Manuel. We've made such great advances in celebrating this American born art form in such a short amount of time. When I was a kid going to music school, which was not that long ago, <laughs> um, you know, I could count on one hand where I could go to school to study jazz. Jazz and Lincoln Center did not exist. Right. 
And now, you know, a, a college or university is not considered a reputable institution if they don't have a strong program of jazz studies, uh, which is pretty interesting. So the, the one way we measure it is we exist, which is outstanding. Right. Um, we offer over 160 performances a year, and most of them are sold out. So just the fact that that many people are having access to this art form is outstanding. Uh, to see the education component we have, the connection with Stony Brook, all of our graduate uh, DMA recitals and performances happen there. We have a young artists program there. But on a personal level, I would say the, the way I measure it is, uh, you know, we see families there. We see people coming again and again. I remember once, and I won't get into the, the details, but when we had a, a rather unsettling time in our politics here, I remember people coming to the loft and saying, you know, we just had to come and, and, and a refresh. Art is a refuge. Yeah, yes. we just had to, you know, come and experience And it's nice it. that you mentioned families because this speaks again to the intergenerational mission, mm -hmm. you know, with which you opened our conversation. I mean, this is the thing that inspired you from the very beginning. You were reaching out to an older generation that they would impart their wisdom and experience to you. You're doing the same. That's what this uh, remarkable organization does. We're, we're just about out of time, but I, I have two related questions. Uh, uh, one is simple. Uh, you liberated a lot of space in your house when you uh, created the <laughs> Lazloff, right? You were talking about how That's cluttered true. it is. Yes. What'd you do with all that space? Well, it was empty for a while, but I filled it up again quickly. So oh, <laughs> some, some of it w was given to the children. The children <laughs> okay. actually have space now. Oh, good. My wife's good. happier too. Good. She could park the good. car in the garage. So yeah. <laughs> so it's so a one, one final question, Tom, just again, going back to your opening remarks, uh, uh, and also that opening question with which you engaged, um, you know, you will over time increasingly become the mentor to a new generation. You're already in that role, what you're doing with the loft and in your teaching and in your, in your art. Um, so again, what would you say to Tom 20, 25 years younger, if you could have talked to him back then, hmm. given what you know now? Right. Well, I think I would have said you're doing some good things and keep up the good work. Keep it up. And... I think I would have said, even then, I would have said, work hard, work harder, um, be sensitive, give back. That's great. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for a, for a wonderful conversation. Most of all, I want to thank you for the remarkable ways you link art with memory and remembrance and, of course, mentorship and guidance for, for the community of having a tremendous impact. We're all very proud of you and proud to know you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this opportunity. But hey, before we go, I have to put you on the spot because I know that you were a cornet player as a kid. And, uh -oh. you, and you did share with me a few months back in a conversation that... Uh, back very in poor the, one. In the Boy Scouts, though, you, you, you played uh, back when... Pre should I mention who was president Yes, then? yes. President Kennedy. Yes. Dates me a little bit, but a little it's bit. the truth. It's okay. It's the truth. So I, mean, I have my cornet sitting here, and um, I do have a beautiful face for radio. So um, I thought maybe we could, in your honor, because I'd like to thank you for your leadership here at the school, maybe uh, we could uh, impro improvise, and I could play a little blues for you? Please. Okay. Please. A great way to right, so uh, this conclude. Is, I think we'll make this up on the spot, and we'll call this Blues for Burn. How about that? <laughs> great. Beyond the expected. Yeah. Thank you very much. You didn't much. see that coming, did you? <laughs> Thank you so much. You. That's just fun. <laughs>